Talks at Google, I'm Kevin Valk, and we have the directors of The Box Trolls. We have Mr. Tony Stocky and Graham uh, Annabelle. So uh, let's take a look at the trailer for Box Trolls. They've got the whole world in their hands. 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 They've got the flowers and the trees in their hands. They've got the sun and the moon in their hands. They've got the wind and the rain in their hands. They've got the whole world in their hands. They've got it. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, when we first saw that trailer that they were going to release, we objected immediately. We said, there's no way that you can show how we build the characters before the movie <laughs> even comes out. Don't show them with their faces off. <laughs> but in fact, we were totally wrong. Because what people have found the most interesting about that, especially the more and more we travel around and show up, is the fact that these are handmade objects, that these are tangible things that really exist in the real world. Um, and, you know, every animator and every filmmaker's quest is, is to put together something that nobody's ever seen before. Something that, that, you know, it used to be like when we were young, when you saw your first CG animated dinosaur running across a field or the water tentacle in the abyss. It seemed every few years there was something else amazing that you've seen. But nowadays we have so many amazing visual images that we see that it's become sort of um, passe. Um, so our quest on this movie, you know, the fact that Alan Snow's book, Here Be Monsters, had this great Victorian setting, and Leica had been a studio that had been together for three uh, films at this point, that we could put together something that would be a visual sort of feast, something that nobody had ever seen before. Yeah, uh, you know, stop motion has a tendency to feel like it's shot on a tabletop set, and that's because it's shot on a tabletop set. <laughs> um, and so we knew with a lot of lessons learned on Coraline and Paranormal, we were going to find ways to try to bring a bigger sense of scope, scale to the film. We wanted this big comedic adventure, the box trolls, to, to feel different and yet preserve what was special about stop motion. So we really approached this film as a, as a hybrid. Uh, you know, at its core, it is stop motion. It's still puppets and it's still sets. But we found all kinds of new ways and different ways to integrate our VFX department to bring that world to a larger scale than I think audiences are, had ever seen before in a stop motion movie. And it all started about 10 years ago when Leica bought the rights to Alan Snow's book, Here Be Monsters, which is a fantastic Dickensian steampunk tale sort of smashed together with a Monty Python tone, um, which we loved right away. What Problem we was, <laughs> well, what we, we didn't it. love was the fact that it truly is a cast of thousands in, a, in the book. Part of Alan Snow's appeal in his writing is that he is every page creating new characters to get the old characters out of the situations, and we knew very early on we weren't going to be able to maintain that kind of pace with building puppets. So we eventually gravitated to the most compelling invention that Alan had in the bush, book, which was the box trolls. Um, and it was the emotional story of these little box troll characters raising uh, this character Arthur in the book that became the, the heart of the story and was what we rallied around and it sort of became a rule. Uh, Travis describes it as ruthless economy. Once we knew that that emotional story was the box trolls and eggs, the, everything else 
had to get thrown out and it could only creep back into the it movie. It had to fight its way back into the story. Yeah, if it supported that emotional core. Um, but it's a long journey figuring out stories. I mean, Here Be Monsters was uh, bought at like a, the same time as Coraline, so it's been pretty much 10 years to get to this point of mm -hmm. actually making the film. And you know, every animated film is storyboarded first. That's the way for it. We get to make the film before we make the film. We storyboard the whole thing out, we record temp voices to figure out our performances before we actually go to the final actors and get there. You know, go to Sir Ben Kingsley or Nick Frost or um, Simon Pegg and then get the final voices which we need before we commence animation. So we spend a long time. Each story reel is like a rewrite. It's like rewriting the script and you see if the story works and then you present it to everybody at the studio. So in this process what you're always looking for is for that one sequence where you feel this is the movie. This has the emotional tone, the action tone, has everything that you want the final movie to have because once you have that one sequence that really works, we call it the tent pole sequence, then you throw everything else out and you start over building out from that one sequence. And early on in the process, this sequence here was the one that yeah. was that tent pole sequence. Where'd it go? Quick, turn around! Come on, move it! Over there! After him! Very nice. Yeah, yeah. there was a lot of things that we loved about this sequence, the relationship between the box trolls and the baby and stuff that just gave us the, the little breadcrumbs we needed to find the core of the story. Yeah, but the funny thing with story, of course, is that, yeah, we basically threw everything out that came before the sequence, everything out that came after the sequence, and built the whole movie from this sequence because this was working. And within about three months, we cut this sequence. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just kind of the way it goes, but it allows you that step. It, it pointed us in the direction down the road we knew 
we needed to go with the movie, and so. Yeah, there's a great, there's a famous um, uh, guy, um, Joe Ramp, who was a head of story at Pixar for years and a lot of other places, and he always used to teach that you have to trust the process. That even though it feels like you're not making any progress and that you've gone down another dead end or something like that, that if you just trust in the process that you are making progress and you will find the story. So we felt on track with the story at this point, and we moved on for what we call the look of picture. Mm -hmm. um, and when we immediately, um, on, on reading the book, we had thought of a few artists we wanted to work with. We started to work with a French artist named Nicolas de Cressy, who's a French graphic novelist, who has an amazing ability to draw images of these great European cities. He has a really great shape language that he draws in, and there's this beautiful line quality in the ways he draws. So we worked with him for a few weeks to get some inspirational sketches. He's definitely you know, the best person in the world at drawing piles of junk, which was <laughs> real boon for us. He also did this image of a, of a, a chandelier made by the box trolls underground. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's from light bulbs that they've collected in the garbage and wires that they've found and stuff. And there was something about this image that really struck home with us and Travis Knight, um, the CEO of, of Leica, where we loved the idea of this thing. We loved getting to know the characters who would build something like this. And we all looked forward to the people at Leica actually building something like this with their amazing abilities. Um, so we moved forward from there, and we had a guy, oop, a guy named Michel Breton, who had worked on uh, Coraline previously at the studio, and he began to hone all these ideas into what we call the look of picture book. And it's a book that we hand out to all 400 people who work on the job eventually in the fabrication department, in the puppet department, and, and all the rigging departments, so they know the set of rules that everything in the movie has to go by, whether it's a, a torqued shape that's twisting a little, has thick and thin lines on it, has color and stuff. Yeah, and it was a real challenge for the art department to figure out ways that, were, you know, a huge part of what Michelle does so well is his line work, as you can see in this image. And they had to find all kinds of ways to represent that wonky realism that Michelle brought to everything through his line work. And the scale of, of this film was going to be a huge challenge. But uh, Kurt Enderly, our art, our art director, was able to find ways using shadows and shapes and color on buildings beyond just twisted light poles and chandeliers to find ways to bring that shape language that Michelle had created into the film. This is another, this is the Portly Ryan's foyer of the building, and it's another chandelier. I clearly love chandeliers. <laughs> um, this chandelier was built by Kurt uh, in the art department on a twisted wire and stuff, so that became the first object that we really loved, the thought captured. Michelle's drawing style in the world of the film. Because you don't get anything free in animation, and particularly in stop motion. Anything that appears in front of the camera um, has to be built, has to be made. Um, we don't inherit any of the props from Paranorman or Coraline because they're done in a different style. Yeah. So once the images started to land in black and white, um, we moved forward with Paul Lassane, a great matte painter and production designer in LA. And we definitely wanted to make a stop motion movie that wasn't too dark. Yeah, beyond just making a stop motion movie that felt bigger in terms of scale, we also wanted to see what we could do to bring brightness, color to a stop motion feature, because that's another aspect of it that they tend to have desaturated palettes in a lot of stop motion movies, and it's great, it's wonderful, it's an effective thing, but we really wanted to see and push the studio to try to do something a little more colorful. And Paul Hussain was the perfect guy to bring that to the film. He had, he'd worked on Dick Tracy, he, yeah. he really knew how to bring color into things. He also did a great job of um, color styling the Boxtrol Cavern because the Boxtrol Cavern itself as a location is almost a character in the film because at the beginning of the film it's supposed to be a warm, inviting place where the, the hero eggs is raised, but little by little it becomes a depressing, drab place as more and more Boxtrols are kidnapped by the men in red hats. So he did a great job of, we did that predominantly through light and color. Yeah. Now um, we found ourselves in a weird spot because so usually when you develop a feature, you kind of start with your characters and your character design first, and then the world kind of begins around that. But Michelle, Paul, and Tom McClure had done such a tremendous job in quickly figuring out the shape language and realizing the world. We had the world before we really had the characters nailed. And that put Mike Smith, an amazing 2D animator, in the interesting position of utilizing what he saw in Michelle's world to bring characters that would fit within it. Um, and he worked much like Michelle had done, where he worked in silhouette first and began to then put in the details and get that, again, that shape language to show up in the actual characters as well as the buildings and the, and the world around them. And we were still going through a lot of story changes. At mm -hmm. one point, um, rather than having an allergy to cheese, um, Snatcher had a really bad case of equinophobia. <laughs> He was afraid of horses, uh, but he dreamed of being the man on a horse who rides into town and is, you know, 
as met as a hero and stuff. So that was another sort of dead end we went through in story. When we kind of struck upon this idea of him having this cheese allergy, which isn't in the book, but is similar to something in the book, um, we knew it would be a huge test of the department that makes the faces for our movie. Um, also, in the storyboarding process, we fell in love with all these ideas of what the box girls could do with their boxes. Yeah, initially, the puppet department was really excited when this project got greenlit because they were like, wow, finally a movie where we've got a lot of the main characters wearing massive boxes. We can just hide all the mechanics in there. This is going to be a breeze. Uh, that quickly turned into a nightmare for them because as the boards evolved and as the story evolved, we just kept putting the box girls into situations where we had more and more special case things that they needed to do. And they very soon realized there was no way they were going to be able yeah, to fit all the mechanics us. into it. And they had to come up with a lot of innovative methods to, uh, to get the box drills to feel and look and work for the story. You know, uh, the box drills hide in their boxes. So the way that's done, because there is so <clears throat> much rigging inside the box drills boxes, their arms can actually retract into the boxes. There's enough movement in the shoulders of the arms so they can begin the motion in. But then there's shorter and shorter arms are made that click on so it looks like they retract into the box. The same as of the head. The head can begin its motion down, and then there's smaller and smaller heads that you click on so they appear to disappear into their boxes, which is one reason why in animation you do things fast, because then you use fewer and fewer in between <laughs> frames to get where you want to go. Quick is good. Yeah, but even before then, we wanted to, we wanted to, there's an old, there's an old test that you do in animation, which you animate a flower sack, just a flower sack, to see if you can give it personality and you can give it expression and emotion. You can make the flower sack sort of sag or be excited and stuff. So we want wanted that kind of bendability in our hard boxes too. So they became a long run of testing boxes. So this is what we did for months. <laughs> we played with cardboard boxes. And they were also trying to find a material that would look like cardboard and not be too rigid. Yeah, originally they did try using cardboard, but it just there was no way it was going to hold up to the rigorous shooting schedule. So this is an early test where we're getting the amount of movement that we wanted out of them. We'd also done tests where they moved like <laughs> chimpanzees or moved like different animals. But more and more, we found that their character came through much better if you kept it simple. This was the first test that made us all think, oh, we may not be idiots. This might actually work, because he was <laughs> such a lovable little guy. We also combine a few other extinct <coughs> forms of animation at Leica. Um, we do a lot of 2D animation, traditional hand-drawn animation in our process. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's all tied into our, our RP process, the face replacement animation that we do. And it utilizes right from the beginning the model sheets of you know, the expressions that are drawn in 2D are then handed to uh, an excellent 2D animator, Dave Vandervoort, in the studio who uh, fully animates and pencil tests uh, the complete range of each character's emotion. Like, try to figure out exactly how extreme all the face masses are going to move for each character, happiest, angriest, all the expressions they could possibly do, using usually, hopefully, finished dialogue if we have it available. And that then, that 2D animation then becomes the guide that is handed over to the CG 3D animators in Maya, who then begin to build the faces in the computer digitally and get all the face expressions working. And then that, once that gets approved by the directors, becomes the faces that get printed physically out of the 3D printer and then get put onto the puppet. And this is an example of the faces that are printed for the guy. And we print these by thousands. Yeah. For Eggs. every real nuance of change of expression. Eggs had about 15,000 pieces created for his face for the film, which in different combinations, because uh, they're usually actually typically split between the brow and the mouth. And so all those different combinations with the 15,000 pieces allowed for about 1.4 million possible expressions, which I think I've got about six. So Eggs was a little ahead of me. And there's a whole like Dewey Decimal system of how we track these things, of what the expression is doing. Usually the faces are split along here. So you have different eyebrows that can go along with different mouths. And there's a whole room that we call the face library, where there is boxes of these that are basically like a pizza box. And they're full of face after face after face. We have a little clip that shows you the process. If I can get this back on. They don't make you. You make you. We knew from, from Paranorman that you know, we had this color printing process that worked really well, but it worked well to produce some naturalistic skin tones. 
and now looking at these really vibrant sort of theatrical paint jobs that the directors wanted on box trolls, we were sort of scratching our heads saying, well, in theory the machines can do it, but we don't really know if they can do it. And maybe they can do it once, but are they going to be repeatable? If you get a beautiful paint job, how is that paint job going to animate? And we, we came up with a way to do it. It worked really well. Oh, my little angel, my weird little angel. Looking at how we were able to improve the process on Paranorman and then looking at the script to Box Trolls and these really specialty story moments, we needed to have something unique. Analogy Snatcher is a perfect example of that. Isn't this nice? His face has so much swollen weirdness to it that having him say a line of dialogue, you get so much follow through with his cheeks and his lips. Something on the choices, Jesus that it really, we learned very early on that there was no way that we could try to recycle these poses. Stand back, peasants. You don't touch your king. So what we decided to do was tackle every single one of Allergy Snatcher's shots as its own unique animation. And then we would have to print out those faces. Faces, they were so big, we were only able to print 12 faces in 12 hours. And how many can you usually do in 12 hours? Probably 150 of like eggs, as an example. See, you're not like them. You have no idea that this thing that you're watching, this creature, is not real because of the amount of nuance and subtlety and naturalism that we were able to put into these faces. They feel like they're really little creatures with skin and movable muscles and volume change. And when you pick them up and you tap on their faces, they're just a hard plaster that isn't movable. But through replacement animation, you get some really lovely, smooth animation. Nice. <laughs> So, that, so that's, that's probably the most high-tech element we've added to stop motion. Stop motion is, 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 a, is a technique that's as old as cinema itself. I mean, Georges Méliès, the French, great French silent filmmaker, was doing it at the turn of the century and stuff. And then there's been a long line of, of individuals throughout cinema who've continued to move it forward. George Powell did replacement animation in the 30s and 40s and stuff. And then what Travis has done at Leica, his vision for Leica, is to try to take this group of people, which he likes to describe as Luddites, <laughs> and futurists and have them share more than a parking lot, having them share um, a whole studio. And early on, they brought this rapid prototype process to Coraline. And at first, the faces were only printed in black and white, mm -hmm. and they had to be hand painted. And then on Paranorman, they were able to print them with a little bit of color on them, um, freckles and a little bit of rouge on the cheeks and stuff. And then for our film, it took another great leap forward. As you can see, these faces are very elaborately colored. Yeah. Um, it creates a, a kind of bizarre step in our process, uh, definitely in, as Ooh. directors. Because you know, there's a phase where we approve storyboards and the story reel, uh, and then when the RP folks get involved, uh, it's an interesting thing for the animators because it sort of divvies up their performance, their overall performance. They need to basically sit down with their assigned shot in storyboard form and begin to visualize the entire performance, but focus just on the face performance up front because production-wise, those faces need to get signed off on and approved and then printed so that they're ready for the stage maybe anywhere from one or two weeks to two months down the line. And so they need to sort of figure out their entire face performance up front, get us to sign off on it, and then find themselves two months later sitting with that pizza tray with the faces that they chose, we all chose a few months ago and make sure that the performance they had in their head that was going to work with that face all comes together. And yeah, and the way they get way. us to sign off on it is they send us what we call a play blast, which is their Maya animation, uh, 3D CG animation <laughs> of the face shapes. They send it to editorial and we cut it into the story reels on top of the storyboard drawings. So this is the Maya animation oh. of the faces prior to being printed out. So we look at the performance on yeah. here. And we can add in-betweens or say push this a little bit further. And oftentimes later in the um, production cycle, we'll already have these printed faces. So we'll say, use those faces that we used in sequence 32, um, where uh, uh, you know, Fish's face was much more angry. Use those mouths. And it's really a, it's a, it's an amazing, you know, we say it's sometimes it's animation by librarians, because it's amazing that they've made these many faces that can move in and out of so many different poses without there being a pop. And there's the a animation. moment right there where you see face, uh, Fish's face kind of stretch a bit with the nose. That's because the animator wanted to try to have a little rub with the puppet hand on the face uh, when he went, was going to be out on the stage with the final uh, puppet. 
But that's like, again, that scary sort of commitment up front because he's got to figure out and guess at the timing he's going to use for how long that hand's going to rub that face. And we all, again, have to sort of commit up front to like, that's the faces we're going to use for this. And here's the final version of it when the faces are actually all together. So that's the final shot of that. Mm -hmm. that's the next there. Now, one of the things we do in our process as well is we have breakdown meetings, uh, which is where all the heads, all the futurists and all the Luddites and the heads of their departments come together for the meeting where we break down each sequence of the film shot by shot. And it's always kind of an incredible process and very energetic meetings. Everybody comes in there with their homework already done and shot by shot, different departments are vying for why they should or shouldn't be involved in each piece and who's going to do what, basically. And again, because this film, right from the get-go, was going to be a hybrid and a real use and, uh, of, of the VFX department, uh, you know, the digital guys were involved heavily with the whole process, but at the end of the day, it always came down to what delivered the style of the film best. And so we had a lot of surprising inventions always from our rigging and, and puppet departments where practical effects showed up in places where we didn't even anticipate. Yeah, for me, I, I've worked in stop, uh, stop motion a little bit in my past, but prior to that, I'd mostly worked on CG films. And usually on a CG film, you know the issues that you're going to confront. We need fur, we need wet fur, we need a snowstorm, we need to develop all this stuff. Um, what I was really surprised at the culture at Liker is a lot of those decisions aren't made till the 11th hour. You have this breakdown meeting, and people are still discussing, how are we going to do the water in the sewer? And I can't, you know, I know we're going into production on that shot. And I could never get used to the fact that it waited to this, this late hour for this meeting for it to happen. There's a shot in the movie of eggs in the sewer, and he's going to go above ground. And usually in something like that, you would use CG to do water, because water is very difficult to do in any kind of traditional form of animation stuff. But at this meeting, we ended up having a totally different way of it being done. Yeah. There's nothing that exists before we start on one of these films. Every single thing that you see has got to be designed and built by hand. Huh? What? You don't get anything for free in stop motion. We've really got to plan out every single element. And that goes as far as the fire and the smoke and water and all the natural elements that you see on screen. Tell me everything! As an art director, it's awesome. I mean, how often do you get to create everything? I mean, that's an incredible sense of power. One of the things that's incredibly difficult to do in a stop motion film is bring the environments to life in a believable way. And it's something that was very important for us in this film to have that level of atmosphere. We talk about what's water gonna look like? What's the destruction? What's dust gonna look like? What are the materials that we would use to create these images? And that's where we start. You can't change nature. We created this entire sewer system with flowing water and dripping water out of just plastic and glass. What we have behind me is a sheet of glass uh, that has ripples in it, and it's made from shower glass. And that's passing from left to right, and that's giving us our flow. And then what we've done is we've created a little nest of mirrors and wires and bits of blue masking tape. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing the effect of the ripple glass passing over those wires and mirrors and that's given us the illusion of the highlights above ground. How curious, how peculiar. The 24, 25 different kinds of weeds that we have growing in Cheesebridge are all specific weeds, but yet they're sort of stylized in a way that puts them into our world, which I think is the important thing. A new species, never seen before. 
For the fire, we did a lot of early tests on uh, with using cheesecloth. Our rigging department did this amazing series of, of flames and this amazing fire out of just using suspended upside down cheesecloth hit with kind of this orangish yellowish light. And it looked incredible. The attraction to making like natural elements is partially the challenge of uh, taking on nature. You just become more appreciative of like the things you take for granted by delving so much deeper into the subject matter. It's the little moments. And when you've got it, you just feel like you're, just, you're kind of neck and neck with nature. There's quite an empowering feeling about it, trying to emulate nature. <laughs> So in the end, it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you can reproduce the style of the film the best way. So um, every film is different. You know, in a lot of special effects houses, their goal is to have everything look realistic, uh, to look real. For our VFX department, their problem is that every film is stylistically different, so they need to make it look like that. Like we use CG extra characters in the background, and they have to be indistinguishable from these puppets in, in all their texture and form, and all the effects has to do that. There's probably not a frame in the film that doesn't have some sort of CG um, assistance to it, whether it's compositing or adding atmosphere and stuff. Yeah. We've got three clips here that give you a sense of just how much the VFX department helped out in certain sequences. Yeah, the core of every sequence is... Always, yeah, always at the core of it, it is a stop motion feature because it is always puppets and anything that they touch and interact with is physical as a set. So there's rig removal, mm -hmm. then adding the far background, far distant atmosphere, closer atmosphere, then we start to drop into CG City because they're not going to interact with the city in this shot. Then there's the atmosphere between the characters and the camera. And there's an all CG City, all rendered on style. Now, we built a lot of those buildings whenever the characters had to interact with them. <clears throat> but in this scene, they had to match the look of those built buildings, adding more atmosphere and chimney smoke. Here's the Red Hats pursuing eggs, fish, and shoe. Their animation element is comped in, the far background, with cheesecloth crowd, uh, clouds that were generated by the art department. And then we put in more atmosphere in the city. Now this next shot, everything that the characters touch, every rooftop and stuff, is real. But everything else is CG set extension. Rig removal. This film, too, we used extensively a previs department to help for a lot of these action sequences to really figure out the scope of each of the shots and to, to maximize or minimize how much overbuilding would happen so we knew exactly what the characters were going to interact with before we went out to the sets and how much coverage we were going to need. And that sequence there took, took a few months uh, to board and figure out and stuff and we thought, oh yeah, sequence 700, that's how we know them by their names. Yeah. Sequence 700, that's going to be the hardest, the rooftop chase. Or sequence 2350, the battle at the end of the movie where Snatcher destroys the market square in the giant mecha drill. Now that'll be the hardest one. And we were wrong both Way times because we didn't have any idea what we were doing. Yeah. The hardest thing to do in the box trolls far and away was ballroom dancing. <laughs> Um, it nearly really, killed the studio. Yeah, that really kind of caught us, uh, us off guard, and, uh, and it really did max out every department in, in the building. And as described earlier, the breakdown meetings that we have, this is, that was when Tony and I realized we were in a lot of trouble because, again, those meetings, there's coffee and cookies and everybody's chatting, and it's, very, it's got a lot of energy to it. We walked into the room for the breakdown meeting for, for the dance sequence, dead quiet. Nobody was talking. No one would even make eye contact with us. Because they just, knew better than we knew. Yeah, they all just were quietly leafing through their packets, looking at each other like, we can't, how do yeah. we do this? And each, every, <laughs> every department, it was a difficult thing to storyboard. There's a great storyboard artist, uh, Manuela Cozzi, who boarded the whole sequence. Then Dario Marinelli, the composer, had to write a, a brand new waltz and also make it score in different places, a little bit more romantic, a little bit more action-oriented. And then we uh, hired two choreographers from the Portland Ballet to come out and reproduce the entire dance sequence on one of our stages, and, and we shot it there. Then we did a, a CG previs of that, too, so we could figure out the speed of the camera rotations and movement as we're swirling amongst the dancers. Um, and then the animation people had to come in and figure out a way to make the skirts on the female characters that they could dance with, because underneath those skirts, there are no legs stuff. There's just like a slinky apparatus so you can make the skirt go up and down and swirl around. There was even a shot in the middle of the sequence where Eggs hides 
underneath the skirts, which we knew would be impossible because the skirts that we had built didn't seem to lift high enough to do it. And so you had that nightmare scenario for us, which is a real character touching a CG element, touching a CG element, and trying to do that is really difficult. Um, anyways, we continue forward, and this is Jan Maas, the animator, in time lapse, animating Eggs and Winnie's entry into the dance. So it's pretty rare that he was able to animate even with stairs and walls in the background. Usually those had to be composited in because animator access is something you have to worry about. The animators have to be able to comfortably reach the puppets at all time. Mm -hmm. So most of the time for the sequence, he was just boarding characters on the parquet floor. And we would add everything else in, compositing in the VFX department after that. Um, it, it was incredibly difficult for Jan to do. Um, it was tricky for all of us too because out of all the sequences in the film, this one was the most sort of pieced apart for the longest time in the production yeah, the schedule. So we never knew how yeah. all these pieces were treated. And unfortunately for us, it gets it was a little done hot in the summer. Yeah, yeah, it gets, a, it gets <laughs> awful hot in the summer, so we had to visit Jan with his shirt off, which is <laughs> even more terrifying than Snatcher. <laughs> so this is the exciting life of a stop-motion animator. And then when you see the sequence in the film, you'll realize that the camera is doing a lot of, that's the camera in the upper right, is doing a elaborate camera move up into the air, and there's, the whole room is full of CG extra dancing around these yeah. characters. And again, it took, it took all 18 months of our shooting schedule to produce a little less than two minutes of finished footage in the film. And here, I can show you that sequence now. They have to be real, but most of the rest of the characters are There you are. Extras. We have to get to your father. You can't just cut through. We dance. We'll what? Like this. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. This is that shot that Jan was working on. Just make a box. You made me get out of my box. With your feet, silly. That's it, Eggs. You're dancing. Snatcher is here. Who? Where? My turn, madam. <gasps> Fru -fru. <sighs> Winnie. Mm. Uh. <laughs> Eggs, look out! Ooh. 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 Oh. Ooh. So uh, usually when we do this, uh, we do this talk and say DreamWorks or, or, or Pixar or Disney, you can see all the CG animators going, why would you even do a movie like this? What is the point? You know, and, and, and for us, it is because there, we think there is a special quality, you know, and I think, I think Travis's idea of, of, of updating the company as much as possible, sort of dragging this technique and this art style into the future, um, 
is predicated on that idea that there's something unique looking. And for me, the idea is just it's deep down in the DNA and in your subconscious, everybody remembers playing with dolls or playing with a model train set of moving something around and giving something a little bit of life. And these objects, the fact that when you look at them on the screen, they don't look like CG generated characters. They don't look like real people. They look like tangible objects that you can grab. And we have seen it over and over again in every place we go to is that people just can't keep their hands off our puppets. <laughs> as soon as they see them, they want to grab them. There was, we were just in New York, and yeah. there was about 30 young girls who came screaming down after the Q&A and yeah, we just about destroyed lost puppets. our puppets. <laughs> so, and that's something among even stop motion animators is, is when they, they'll look at your designs and they'll look at your maquettes and stuff and they'll say, yeah, I like it, I like the idea of it and stuff. But when they look at a puppet that they can't keep their hands off of, that they really want to start animating, <clears throat> that's when you know you really have something. So that's why we, we think we have this, the quest for this technique and, and, and for this look. Yeah, I think for a lot of folks, even if they're not aware of the process when they watch a like a film, they feel that difference. It is something unique. And, and I find it kind of funny in this day and age where so many animated features are CG generated that in a weird way, we at like are giving audiences something new by doing something so incredibly old. Um, so it's, kind of, it's a un very unique place to work. And uh, we should the yeah, we should show them. Yep. Thank you. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. That's a really, really good insight to everything. And so I kind of want to talk about you guys' kind of interest in kind of how you got brought into this project. So, Tony, you 
have been around for a while in the <laughs> industry. I mean, you worked all the way back in you know special effects with as an effects animator on Back to the Future and Hook and and Rocketeer and Ghost and James and the Giant Peach was kind of your first experience in stop motion. Yep. Is that kind of what drew you into animation? Uh, no, I actually prior to that um, I worked. At, I went to school at CalArts, uh, California Institute of the Arts, from about you know in the mid '80s. And after that, I worked in the salt mines of animation in Saturday morning cartoons in Korea and Japan and Taiwan. So I, I did my time in the, in the spice mines of Kessel <laughs> and animation working on Ewoks Adventures and Popeye in the Stone Age and stuff. So I was used to working on crap. Uh, <laughs> so I, I got really lucky later. I, I moved to San Francisco and I worked at a place called Colossal Pictures, which was a fantastic advertising studio that did a lot of mixed media and stop motion. So I got a chance to try a lot of different styles. Then I started working at ILM and, and then working in story at PDI DreamWorks and stuff. So the Bay Area had quite a few studios at that time and it was a great area to work in. You could jump around and do a lot of different stuff. So I kept getting a taste of stop motion with Henry Selleck on James and the Giant Peach and at Colossal yes. and even at that point at ILM they still did some stuff. Practically Rocketeer was done with, with stop motion. So I kept getting a good taste of it but I'd never got to work on a whole feature. So when the opportunity came up to visit yes. friends at Leica about seven years ago uh, who were working on Coraline, I jumped at it and that's when I met Travis Knight and he gave me Alan Snow's book to read. Very nice. And Graham, how are you? Uh, well, I, I attended Sheridan College in Canada and spent a bit of time in Toronto. And I got an opportunity at one point to, I was animating at that point, I got an opportunity to storyboard for Chuck Jones. They were making theater shorts back in the early 90s, and I got this amazing opportunity to spend a week in L.A. and, and sit with Chuck Jones and another group of other story artists and work out all these theater shorts, and I came away from that experience going, wow, I want to be a storyboard artist. That's, that's my thing. And then I spent 15 years living in the Bay Area working as an animator in video games. <laughs> um, but during that time, uh, I continued to do, I'd been doing a lot of comic book stuff, and I'd done my own series of comic stories under the name Grickle, and that was the thing that I guess Henry Selick saw uh, up in Portland when he was beginning to assemble a team for Coraline. And he offered this opportunity for me to come up and be a, a story artist on his team. So I showed up there and uh, have never looked back since. I've been at Leica, storyboarded on Coraline, Paranorman. And during a lull on Paranorman, I got an opportunity to do some storyboarding for Tony while he was developing Here Be Monsters. And that sort of morphed into me sitting in a chair beside him co-directing it. So <laughs> You're not leaving. So what was the big difference for you, because you've worked on, obviously, Coraline and then Paranorman, of seeing kind of the progression of stop motion that you guys have obviously pioneered here, um, the kind of the blend between CG and stuff, but being a story artist, wh where have you kind of seen the... Being a story artist for me personally, uh, you know, I felt like on my resume it says I've worked on two stop motion features and Coraline and Paranorman. I figured I knew what was involved with the process. I really didn't. Uh, <laughs> there was so much more going on past the point when it leaves the story department that I'd only presumed to know. I always describe it as feeling like a guy who got really good at making paper airplanes and then suddenly finding himself at the controls of a 747. There was just so many more decisions to make. Uh, and it's just, it's been an incredible, it was, it's been an incredible ride the last three years making this film. And I was very thankful to have this guy with me because the experience you had in directing features before was, was huge. Yeah, because you you mentioned something to me earlier, which was about kind of your I, what stop motion is. It kind of brings the worst aspects of live action. Oh, yeah, and yeah, can yeah. You see? yeah, it uh, um, stop motion. A hundred years of stop motion has figured out a way to combine all the worst attributes of animation and live action production, and combining them all together in one cocktail of fear and alienation because. It, it has none of the benefits. If you work in traditional animation, even in CG animation, it's a very iter iterative process. You do a rough version, you show it to the director, you add frames, you pull frames out, you push the poses a little bit more, you work on your faces, and little by little you build the performance you want. In live action, you do as many takes as you want with the actors until you get the shot that you want and stuff. In stop motion, it's very different because in stop motion, once you've got your faces prepared and the storyboards are ready, you bring the animator in, and you may have been working on this moment for two or three years, but it all comes down to that animator launch. The moment you sit down and you explain to the animator what you want, and at that point, he gets what we call a block, which is essentially just posing the puppet on six frames or eight frames. Now, usually you animate on twos or ones. We animate on ones, which means we move the puppet every single frame. And so you get a block to start off with, which may just be figuring out 
it's going to take Fish four steps to make it across the room that he's in the shot, and there may be a camera move. So the block is very rough, and it doesn't have anything to do with performance. And then the animator gets one rehearsal where he does the shot on twos to figure it out, and that becomes his breadcrumbs. And after that, he does it for the final version. And there's no going back. Once he begins to animate the puppet from position A to position B to position C, he's committed to all that movement. You can't go back and tweak any of those poses earlier. And that is just, it's nerve-wracking. Yeah. No, nobody gets into animation to perform in front of a crew of live-action guys standing over your shoulder while you spend two weeks moving a puppet across the screen and stuff. Because it, it, we described it as it's, it's opening night yeah. every day for 18 months with no rehearsals. Yeah. It feels so much it, more like theater to me, I think. Yeah. It's that yeah. same sort of stress of like you give them as much information as you can possibly do, and then they get pushed out on stage, and that's the performance you'll get forever more in the film. Yeah, it's cool. It's like nothing else. It's and you know, and technically, even though this is an American film, it has a lot of British influences. You know, and just some of them. I mean, you know, everyone obviously speaks with a British accent, and then you have you know Nick Frost and Simon Pegg, who are huge you know UK comedians, and then but you have a lot of Monty Python influences in there as yeah. well. And the whole world seems almost kind of like a Charles Dickens kind of story. And you, I mean, you have like the one ton weight, which I don't know if that was a reference to Monty Python or not. But then you have also that scene where Snatcher kind of get has that allergic reaction, and that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From by the <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah. yeah. Now, when we read the book, Alan Snow's book, he's English. Yeah. Um, he's he's eccentric. Um, he's a really <laughs> great, great. He's really great guy, yeah. and um, has a, a lot of crazy influences. That was the tone of the book. We so, always describe the project as Python esque. So yeah. Yeah. we discussed for a minute with, let's set it in Boston, you know, <laughs> and it, that lasted about half the meeting. Uh, yeah. No, it was always going to stay that way, so it seemed natural. And luckily for us, Travis had no problem with that. There would be very few animation studios in the country where they would agree to an all in English cast using people like Richard Ayoade and stuff who aren't that well known here, but Travis never blinked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he thought it was um, appropriate. He wouldn't have had it, you know, any, any other way. And it was way. a bit of revenge. I mean, yeah, Paranorman sure. was a film set in Salem, Massachusetts, Massachusetts essentially. Right. Directed by two British fellows. So and they made, us, our all, turn. <laughs> they made <laughs> us all look ugly and stuff. So we made these guys, and look, as you can see, there's not a straight tooth in the no. thing. So it's, <laughs> our, it's our revenge on uh, Chris and Sam. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Dee Bradley Baker and, and uh, Steve Blum, they kind of, you know, they're really, really talented voice artists, and they kind of created the whole box troll voices <laughs> and their whole dialogue. You know, they drew a lot of influences, they said, from, like, Klingon and Java, you know, language. And I kind of want to talk about, and Tra Tracy Morgan almost has. He plays, <laughs> he has so, like, his personal character. Excellent English accent. Yeah, excellent. He has almost language. Do you find it uh, that you kind of, like, what, what was the development of that language and when you guys kind of landed on that? That was another thing that grew in the whole process. Yeah, it was one of the things where early on we had all these great aspirations of maybe writing, you know, dictionaries of Buckstrow language and have all the words and things be consistent and specific. Uh, and that's kind of what you brought to Dee and Steve initially. And they tried it out. Uh, but once we paired it up with what we had in terms of the character designs and, and where the story was at, it felt wrong. It felt too sophisticated. It felt it, like Klingon. It did feel like Klingon. <laughs> it felt like box trolls were going through the rite of ascension all the right time. <laughs> it, it just didn't seem appropriate. Yeah, and so Steve and Dee were, were huge, hugely helpful in finding ways to simplify that language down into something that was more emotive and, and gestural, but wasn't so specific and didn't have this sort of consistent thing where you felt like you needed a dictionary. You knew through the sounds what the box trolls were getting at, but you didn't hear like individual words so much. It was much more selective, and they were just incredible at improvising on that stuff. Yeah, it was really unique. It was great. And so, and you talk about, a lot about this in your talk, but where do you kind of just start to define the line of where you're going to go stop motion, where you're going to go CG? Whatever delivers the style. And it's you know. surprising. I mean, it, yeah, like all through the process, it would surprise us where we would presume going into a breakdown meeting that something would be VFX digital, and it would end up being practical, and vice versa. Yeah, and we're not purists. Um, there's a lot of people who come to stop motion, and they want to stay practical. You know, they want to stick with a, a, an idea of stop motion where, and it can be incredibly charming. Fantastic Mr. Fox, Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, uh, a lot of those films is they're going to make their smoke out of cotton, or their rain out of gelatin, and that stuff's incredibly charming, and if that suits the tone and the story of the film, that's great. But in our film, which we wanted to open it up a little, make it an action adventure, adventure, action adventure comedy, um, we didn't want you to ever see an effect or something that 
charmed you out of the movie, that threw you out of the movie. It's like suddenly Jeopardy feels real and the world feels really credible, but then something is, you know, smoke is made out of cotton. So we wanted to treat it, our stop motion footage as if it was live action footage and we were adding realistic special effects. Realistic but on style for, for yeah. our movie. Yeah, and you know, you know, you talked about a lot about ballroom, you know, scene and everything, mm. and that was, I mean, everything from the Trolls Cavern and, and the crowd shots and stuff was, and I, what I was actually surprised at with all the stop motion of them jumping on top of each other in the boxes as well, them kind of like gathering up to go to sleep, and was there any of talk of that to doing that CG too, kind of like how you did no. the CG back characters you always wanted no, to do stop the, motion? The one sort of golden rule in terms of like uh, choosing practical or VFX in a situation is again. Anything that the hero puppets interact with needs to be and should be practical. So it, everything was always designed with that at its core, and then we would go from there. However, we wanted to enhance the moment and bring you know different effects into it. But yeah, and it's not it, you know financially it's not worthwhile, and we don't do it. Is there aren't computer avatars for the heroes. We don't have a computer version of eggs or the, the most important eight box trolls. So you always want those guys front and center anyway. So even if part of the pile stacking around them later is CG, when those guys are stacking, they're real puppets because we don't make copies of them digitally. Yeah. Hey, Drew, just, you don't want to make the movie twice when you make a movie like this. And so making a real eggs and a CG eggs would sort of defeat the purpose and be twice as expensive. No, absolutely. And did you find yourself pulling back on some of the VFX stuff? Uh, no. no. No, I mean, the box troll cabin invasion, in fact, we, uh, there's a couple of animators that want to punch us out because <laughs> when Snatcher invades the tunnel there and lands, we animated that whole sequence before we add the effects of all the dust and stuff dropping in, and we kept telling the animators, Good don't one. worry about animating the rocks rolling around the ground, don't worry about, but they would do it every time, so, and when we added all the CG effects, it covered up a lot of their most subtle bits of animation yeah. and stuff. But we wanted it to look super destructive, really <laughs> yeah. over the top. Yeah. And was it helpful? Because I mean, obviously, with all the sequences of having two directors on this, so being co-directors as opposed to just one person. Yeah, it I think when they, when they, you know, during the pre-production phase of it, we're kind of joined at the hip, and we are involved together on almost all the meetings and decisions. But once the shooting schedule begins, that's where the studio really benefits from the fact that there's two of us to be able to split between. Uh, Two different edit suites, and we can kind of streamline and make as efficient as possible the, all the animation launches. We sort of split up on sequences. I mean, we constantly check in with each other all day right long. Next to each other. Yeah. There's 55 stages going on. There's 27 animators working, mm -hmm. um, and they're all working on different shots. There's, you know, there's twice as many stages as animators because you always want their next stage to be setting up when they finish. Um, and so that, those things, you have to go out and meet with those animators each at least every other day while they're working on their shots, you have set visits, you watch what they're doing, or they're completing their shots or completing their rehearsal and you're reviewing them in editorial, and you never want an animator standing there waiting for director input. Yeah. So it, that's when it's really important. Gotcha. Uh, and with the story too, you know, it got, it didn't get as dark as the books. The book is definitely yeah. a little bit darker. You know, I got a little bit with, with uh, you know, Winnie's kind of discussion about the box trolls about how they are stealing oh, and yeah, eating her morbid stuff. fascination <laughs> with them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but was there any uh, any push by the studio by you guys even to pull back on that darkness or put more in no. or was it just kind of where no. the story took you? And, and, you know, um, it didn't have a supernatural element like Coraline did in Paranorman so we were kind of happy for that. We definitely wanted it to brighten it up but we also felt from the very beginning that the, the property, the story appealed for younger kids. Yeah. So we never wanted to jeopardize that. We don't do focus screenings. Travis doesn't do, believe in that stuff. We, we have our own kids, and you know, we make movies that we want to see, and we judge them by our own kids. And honestly, I show it to my kid who's <laughs> sick of seeing it and stuff to try to figure out the moments that might be too powerful and stuff. But we definitely believe that, that, that um, because we're an independent film studio and because Travis is, is really has the vision for the studio, that you want to find stories that are willing to go a little bit darker because you need those lower depths to get the high higher highs emotionally on the other end of the spectrum. And honestly, you know, when you were growing up and you were watching Dumbo and Pinocchio and a lot of those older films, they were willing to sort of go to some of those darker places. And a lot of other studios are, are attached to big corporations and they can't take the risk. They need to sort of stay in a sort of a middle ground there because their films are so expensive to make and they're so much part of the merchandising stuff that they can't risk alienating any possible facet uh, of the public. We don't have those constraints. And so, uh, you know, with you guys having this big success and you guys signed with Focus for three more movies, mm -hmm. I know they're not announced yet, but where do you kind of see this going and kind of pushing? Because obviously the ballroom sequence was a huge learning experience for you guys. Would you guys ever 
tackle something like that again, or is it just like, no, we got to. I actually have a couple I'm of apps I'd like to pitch and see if I can come down here. <laughs> You're a hired set. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to predict because uh, one of the things I've, you know, I've found really amazing about working at Leica is each project has been very specific and been its own thing. Certain things get learned and we evolve, and the departments keep refining things. But I uh, mean, each project brings a whole new set of problems, a whole new set of challenges. Uh, it's, it's like a couple of months ago, everybody at the studio would jump when we called. <coughs> now they completely ignore us when we walk yeah, down the hallway. We're like news. ghosts. And <laughs> the other day, I was talking to Brad Schiff, our animation supervisor, and he's like. Pfft. The faces on your movie are nothing compared to what they're doing. They have five minutes now of the next film done, and they've already started doing stuff, you know, continued to push the rapid prototype process and stuff. That's kind of what's fun about the place, too, because it gets boring for people in the heads of the department to repeat stuff, so they actually like the challenges and stuff, and the next film has a lot of challenges. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're excited to see it. Uh, Q&A for you guys. So we got a first question. Do you feel that animators who come from, like, a traditional or CG background um, get better, become better animators because they have to plan so much and uh, basically do their final shot just once? Uh, I mean, it's funny how many stop motion animators you meet who that's predominantly what they do. Um, there's quite a few of the stop motion people. I know quite a few stop motion animators whose stop motion is what they've always done and they've also, they animate on the computer too. I don't meet so many animators who make the tra transition the other way and choose to go into stop motion later, partially for the reason I described. It's like all animation is hard and hard enough, and then they look at what stop motion animators do and they go, oh, I don't want to go anywhere near that. But there are a lot of stuff, like quite a few stop motion animators started out wanting to be 2D animators, but they couldn't draw, mm -hmm. or they didn't like all the drawing, or they hated the fact that in drawing you have to worry about stuff like volumes changing and staying on model and stuff. Here and in CG, in some ways you're freed up if you don't have great drafting skills or if you don't like worrying about staying on model, staying on the character design and stuff. Here you're purely dealing with performance and timing, which is something that certain animators, that's what they love the best. Others love drawing, but, but all you're worried about is the performance that's going on here and stuff. So that's why I think some CG animators and stop motion animators, the world has been opened up to people who want to be animators but don't draw. Um, so. I don't know how they get used to it, except they've never known anything else. There are places where they do stop motion animation where they're, they're, there's no rehearsals. Um, some TV stop motion and stuff like that, or people who've worked on Gumby and some of that older stop motion. So in some ways, as hard as what we do um, is, it's actually luxurious compared to other jobs that they've been on. It's just that Travis has a very specific sort of um, rigorous idea of the quality of the animation that they want. So it is working at the highest level, and I think that's probably the most intimidating thing. Yeah, definitely. I think the fact that yeah, Travis is one of the lead animators and one of the best in the studio, that uh, that department certainly feels the pressure to, to keep, their, keep their A game up. <laughs> okay, so uh, my question is actually about the, the uh, statement you made about uh, using uh, practical characters for anything that was going to touch another mm. character. Is that, a, is that a, about appearance or about performance? It's, it's about difficulty. It's, it's just very hard to do. Like had we had to do, you know, our plan initially on that shot where Eggs is hiding under the skirts was to put a ring around the real puppets that were there that he was going to interact with so they would dance into place and then Eggs would grab the ring and lift it up and we would use that ring as a guide to put in a CG skirt. And stuff, and that would just be very difficult and time-consuming to do. Not not impossible, but just very hard to do. So that's that's mainly in situations like that we like to just try to avoid it because it a lot, it means a lot of, you know, rotoing out, hand painting frames and stuff like that. So it's just the way the process has developed that we're more efficient to keep it all practical in a lot of ways. And there's a consistency to the appearance that you don't have to worry that you're going to get into some weird realm where you. The two things bumped together aren't looking right, and yeah, like Tony said, it right. just so it sounds like sounds like more performance where a, a single animator or a clump of a team of animators can worry about these two characters doing yes. the right thing yeah. next exactly. to each other, yeah. as yeah. opposed to two different worlds that have to be composited and then yeah, and that, it goes back to sort of trying, you know, making the movie twice instead of, because you have the two worlds. Is one is always enhancing the other and stuff. I mean, there's some, there's a couple of wide shots in there that are predominantly CG, and then they, they would just. Um, you can do camera tricks and stuff to give you that wide views of the city and stuff, but that becomes problematic when you're doing stereo um, in 2D, uh, 3D stuff. Is Those little cheats don't work as well in 3D and stuff. So there's always an answer to every problem, but I don't know any of them. I just sit in the room and wait. Let those guys at the other end of the table <laughs> hash it out. I was curious. You've referred to cost a couple times. 
And uh, you know, he said it would double the cost to do both CG and, yeah. and uh, practical versions of the characters. How does the cost actually compare overall versus doing this? Um, doing I actually try to stay out of that as much as possible, but I do know that all three of Leica's films cost less to make than it takes to make one big Pixar film or one big DreamWorks film. You know, and their films are upwards of two, $200 million it costs to make and stuff. Um, so these are significantly less even given. You know, we have about 400 people at the peak that work on the films in that 18 month project, you know, cycle. When we start storyboarding it, maybe five years ago or six years ago, we start really working on the story. We have a very small crew and then the crew just gets bigger and bigger and bigger till you hit that 18 months of production and then people start to drop off because the puppets are all made and the sets are all made and stuff. So that, that crew is, is big. It sounds like a lot, but it's still not as significant as a big CG feature film. We only have 25, 27 animators. Pixar, DreamWorks, some of those places, they'll have 65, 70 animators work on one of their films by the end of it. And there just aren't 60 or 75 really good stop motion animators in the world. Even if you wanted to have, throw that many bodies at the problem, you, you couldn't find them. Kind of last thing I want to talk about is just was there any moment in the film that was just uh, your kind of favorite moment or your most proud moment that you guys were able to accomplish other than the ballroom scene? Well, I know awesome. for me personally, uh, uh, Snatcher's End. <laughs> uh, out of all the screenings we've attended and done, I always make sure to sneak into the theater to, to be with the audience <laughs> when that moment happens because for me, storytelling wise, that is definitely the most gratifying moment in the film. Yeah. For me, when I first started on it, I loved the story, and uh, my son was born about the time I started reading it. So he immediately felt like the box trolls were like these lost boys, and it's the story of a lost boy. And I started uh, commuting from LA up to Portland, so I had a lost boy at home uh, that I wasn't seeing. So for me, that, that really appealed to me. There's a little sequence in the film where Eggs and Winnie are sitting on the edge of the cavern, and they're talking about what a father is. And for a long time, I kept put, keeping that in there. And Travis liked that film because uh, liked that moment, and Graham liked it because they both have young sons too, and they know when you work in animation, you are uh, the definition of an animator is an absentee father. Uh, <laughs> so you know that element was important, but the story didn't need that moment for a lot of its time, and I always felt like that needs to be in the film. That's at the core of the film. It's really important. But I had a hard time justifying it a lot of times to the story department. They were like, "What is this big conversation Winnie's having when she's talking about a father that doesn't seem to fit in there?" And eventually, the film got to a place where that scene made sense. So that was a scene where there was a lot of other scenes that I fought just as hard for that died miserably, yeah. <laughs> but that one survived. And for me, that was it. And it's it, one of those it, rare moments where the movie, the story gets to breathe a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and it slows down. And just, you know, for me, it's the core of, of sort of the emotional core of the film. That no, is, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's phenomenal. So let's thank uh, Tony and Graham <laughs> for joining us. So Box Trolls will be available digitally, I think, by the end of the month, yep. and then on uh, a disc soon after that. So yeah, anyway. Yeah, so we look forward to you guys' next film when that's announced, and uh, thank you guys all for joining today. Thank you. Thank you.